In August of 1914, one month after the first shots of World War I were fired in Europe, and less than 30 days after Babe Ruth made his Major League Baseball debut with the Boston Red Sox. Margaret Woodrow Wilson, the oldest daughter of the 28th President of the United States, took on the role as the nation's first lady following her mother's death. Margaret, who attended Goucher College and the Peabody Institute of Music in Baltimore, yearned to be a concert singer. But her most famous performance came in 1915 when she recorded singing The Star-Spangled Banner in the White House. The song, which was written 100 years earlier by Francis Scott Key, had not yet become America's national anthem. That took another 16 years in the efforts of Maryland Congressman John Charles Linthicum, who introduced a bill to make the Star-Spangled Banner this nation's official patriotic song 14 times before it became law in 1931. During the Star-Spangled Banner's journey from its start as a barroom song to its adoption as America's national anthem, it traveled the bumpy road forged by this nation's conflicting ideas about race and human equality. Francis Scott Key's role in this journey is rooted in a series of events that began in the early days of the War of 1812. British troops had made their way from Benedict in, south, in the southern part of Maryland. Uh, they marched their way toward Washington and on August 24th they engaged British troops and these are regular British troops. They engaged them at Bladensburg, just outside of Washington, D.C. Um, and they um, fairly handily rout the American troops. It doesn't go well for the American troops, but to be fair, they were hastily assembled, um, and the defenses of Washington were not very well planned, unlike here in Baltimore where they were. In the spring of 1814, as a British fleet massed for an invasion of the Chesapeake Bay, the British commander, Admiral Alexander Cochrane, issued a proclamation that offered slaves freedom if they sought the protection of his forces. On the British side, uh, you have a very interesting uh, and a very interesting dynamic because what the British realize, um, Admiral Cochrane, Sir Alexander Cochrane, who is in charge of the fleet, while he's here, um, he realizes that they can take advantage of the fact that um, this is an area where you have enslaved African Americans. And so in Maryland at the time, what the Royal Marines and the Royal Navy do is they encourage slaves who are in this region um, to join the Colonial Marines. So they put out a proclamation during the, during the Revolutionary War and in the War of 1812 saying that any enslaved people, if they came over to the British cause, would get their freedom. And that happened during the Revolution. And you know, this is another sort of unknown story of the War of 1812. Thousands of slaves did come over and join the British Navy and the British Army. Other folks would see that as a betrayal of their country. But then the question that you encounter is, well, what does freedom mean for these men? And obviously for those enslaved men who decided to join the Colonial Marines, well, to them, a free life in Halifax was a free life in Halifax because they weren't experiencing that in Virginia or Maryland. He was a lieutenant in a militia unit that was sent to stop the British advance on the American capital. But the American troops were routed by British force. The um, British took a prisoner. Among the prisoners they took was a medical doctor named William Beans from Upper Marlboro. Um, so Key, who is acquainted with Dr. Beans, um, and he's a lawyer, is sent out with Colonel John Skinner, the, as I said, the official um, U.S. envoy. He negotiates prisoner releases all the time. That's what John Skinner's job is. Um, Key accompanies him and brings letters that testify to the um, that it testifies to the fact that the Americans treated British soldiers well after the Battle of Bladensburg. Skinner and Key found the British fleet. They were welcomed on board in Baltimore Harbor, and the British and he convinced the British to let Dr. Beans go. However, they said, "Well, we'll let you go. We'll let him go, but not until we bomb Baltimore." And so he's aboard uh, this truce ship, and he's behind the British command ship when they make their way toward Baltimore. They had an armada of 19 ships in the harbor. Uh, and, uh, on the night of September 13th, 14th, they did a sustained bombing for 25 hours. And there's nothing he can do about that, he's just watching it. So there's a great deal of anxiety that builds up for him um, throughout that entire night. When, this, when the firing stopped, 
and the dawn broke, uh, they could see a flag flying over Fort McHenry, and at first they couldn't tell what it was, and a breeze came and he saw it was the American. So he knew that we had won, and he was moved to write this poem. It is a militaristic song. It is a song that was born out of a military struggle uh, that took place uh, well over 150 years ago. Uh, and it came out of that period, uh, and it's probably fairly appropriate for the time. Uh, whether it is appropriate for this day and age is another question to be asked. You know, Sheriff Bell, you do know about our nation's anthem, correct? Yes. Now, previously to our conversation, did you know that there were four stances to our Star Spangled Banner? Uh, I believe so, yes. Four parts? Yeah. I didn't know that. Did you know that there were four parts to the Star Spangled Banner? No. No. I don't know much about it. I didn't know that there were more stances, but I didn't know what the stances were. In the case of the Star Spangled Banner, you don't go to the third verse because the third verse is a very troubling verse. Uh, the first verse celebrates the victory that took place at Fort McHenry uh, in September of 1814. But the third verse decries the flight of blacks from slavery to the British side to serve in the British Army uh, during that battle that occurred uh, earlier in August of 1814 when the British attacked the Battle of Bladensburg, just outside of Washington, D.C. And where is that man who so vauntingly swore that the havoc of war and the battle's confusion, a home and a country should leave us no more. Their blood has wiped out their foul footsteps pollution. A refuge could save their airling enslaved from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave. And the Star Spangled Banner in triumph doth wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. I feel like, well, there's obviously a reason why they left it out. Because a lot of people wouldn't be willing to say it anymore if they knew that this was a key component. I'm taking it as that the Star Spangled, the Star Spangled Banner wasn't intended for black people. That's just reading that. That's how I'm portraying it now. I feel like this definitely needs to be included as far as has how um, our nation is represented, although maybe maybe the wording it, it, it can kind of be misconstrued in a certain way. It's kind of contradictory to the song because if this is about freedom and then they're talking about slavery inside of it, then that's it just contradicts the point. I probably wouldn't sing it anymore, actually, or even I don't know. I wouldn't give it as much respect as I do now. Yeah, that's sketchy. And I don't know why this hasn't been talked about before. I mean, I guess because people don't know about it, but this needs to be, people need to be aware of this because that's not cool. I, mean, I guess it made it kind of made it seem like the slaves, I guess, were evil in a way. Because they said that the Brit they fight for the, um, the British. And the main thing is they're just trying to uh, fight for their freedom. Whose brush stripes and rights 
Sure.